Welcome to One on One. I'm Greg Bassett, your host from the Salisbury Independent newspaper. We've got a newsmaker in the house today, our state's attorney, Jamie Dykes. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you, Greg. It's great to be here. So just from what I read in the paper, this is an exciting time down at the state's attorney's office. That's one way to put it. <laughs> so you're on some high profile stuff, and I don't mean to be laughing about it because it's really mm -hmm. serious, but that's kind of my uh, gallows humor nature. Um, but I have to ask, first off, uh, just tell me what's going on with this investigation in the Salisbury Police Department. Uh, the Salisbury Police Department identified an issue with regard to their property room. Um, that issue um, identified other issues to include um, credibility concerns uh, regarding three officers. Um, we have um, requested um, independent investigations um, by the Maryland State Police, the Office of the State Prosecutor, and the Department of Justice. So it's one of those things like when a, they say when an airplane crashes, three things go wrong in different areas and they all come together at the same time. The property room uh, situation involving a civilian employee is very separate from whatever happened with these officers in 2011. It's mostly separate. There, There is a, a, a smidge of overlap um, in that um, the property room and in the 2011 um, issue, it was um, used to facilitate um, some misconduct. So Police Chief Barbara Duncan just last week uh, said that the three officers were, were on suspension. Uh, mm -hmm. The Deputy State's Attorney, Assistant State's Attorney is on a suspension from your office. An Assistant State's Attorney is right. suspended from um, my office. There's a possibility that the U.S. Attorney's Office is going to come in and help with this investigation. Yes. Yeah, that um, we made the request of the Department of Justice on um, Sunday, February 15th or 16th, uh, and we met with them on the 17th or 16th, um, and they have begun their investigation, I believe. The, all the information um, leads to that. They are quite mum, um, as well they should be. Right, right. Any idea what the timeline for something like this might be? Months. Now, the police officers are um, on paid uh, leave, which is part of the, part of the procedure. Um, I, I cannot confirm or right. deny that. That's, that's what the chief okay. said. Same thing with, with your employee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So what happens next? You just kind of cooperate when the feds get here, or do you do some of your own work in between, or do you feel like you have a handle on what happened? So um, it, from an administrative standpoint within my office, we um, are doing what we need to do. I mean, there are things that that we can do kind of alongside or at the same time um, as the Department of Justice and the Office of the State Prosecutor. Um, but we are, you know, the, the vast majority of work um, from our perspective is providing disclosures um, to all defendants um, that um, may have had property um, items of evidence that were seized from them from the property or that were within the property room um, since 1997 and then providing disclosures, the necessary disclosures as to the three um, police officers. Now, as a reporter, when you filed that disclosure, it was on a, late on a Friday. Um, yes. Uh, we all found out about it like the next week, but I was like, mm -hmm. This is unusual that they would disclose this, but I have to, so I have to salute you in terms of uh, adding transparency to this thing. It's, that's our ethical obligation. We have, there is no, um, gray area um, with regard to the information that we know, either as to the property room or as to the, the information um, received regarding the three officers. There is, there is, it is a bright line um, and there is no gray area. That, that's our ethical obligation. But still, you had to know there was going to be some fallout oh. from, from doing that. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Including, and I don't mean to disparage any attorneys, but every defense attorney can call their client now and go, hey, there might be some new hope on your case because these people were involved and there are some questions about their conduct. Yes, and that is, I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, from 2011 forward, the defendants should have been provided this information. Um, their cases were resolved. They, you know, elected to resolve their cases in the way in which they did, not having the benefit of this information. Um, we... Um, there is a fundamental right to a fair trial um, in this country and in this county, and that is what we will give every defendant. The community deserves it, victims deserve it, and defendants deserve it. Now, there's going to be the nuts and bolts investigation, but you as mm -hmm. the community leader, now you're going to have to address any concerns about you know, integrity within all the departments. How are you going to do that? 
I would caution every citizen um, in this county to not paint law enforcement with too broad a brush. Um, there are in every bad apples in every bunch. Um, know that we are addressing those issues, that we have um, called for independence on all fronts that way, and that if we discover more issues, that we will deal with them the same way. But the vast majority of law enforcement, the vast majority of prosecutors, go to work every day to protect and serve and do the right thing. That would be my caution. So in this case, the three people, the three suspects, one had a no pros, the other two took plea deals. Did the mm -hmm. evidence problem affect the outcome or did they, would they have been, would they have taken the plea deal anyway? Do you think it affected the outcome of the cases? The defendants were entitled to that information. So it's um, whether or not it would have affected the outcome, uh, we can't say, but they were certainly entitled to know that information before entering guilty pleas. You go back 20, 25 years here, uh, there was a kind of a history of the state's attorney's office, the sheriff's office, the city police, and even the state police not getting along, not working in conjunction with each other. That has felt different, a lot different, mm -hmm. certainly since you've been around, um, and in, in recent years at least. Does this cause more divisions to return, or can you guys still work together? I believe we can work together. I mean, we all have a common mission um, and a common goal, and we're all good partners. So I, I anticipate that will continue. Is there anything about this I forgot to ask? Independence, transparency, um, when we can, you know, transparency is a long-term goal, but there are some things that trump um, that, and that is an active, open investigation. But ask people to be patient, trust the leaders um, that they have put in place um, to properly conduct um, all of those things, um, and we'll be transparent in the end um, when we're permitted to do so. Now, I've always said that I think you have the hardest job of anyone anywhere around. I've always said that. And I've also said that if I had my life to live over again, my career, I would think I think the greatest service to society um, would be putting bad guys in jail. You know, that's really you know it's, it's simple and it's kind of really barbaric to say it that way. But at the same time, I think that's that's a really important service to the community. Um, and you've been on the front lines in another issue uh, with the school system, with the violence in the school system, and it's one of those things where you could kind of. Could, could sort of like lay back if you wanted and like like the problem come to you to deal with mm -hmm. but you've gotten in there and you've really worked with these administrators to try to find a solution to this situation we are it's all about the right people in the right places who are committed to our community i know um, i believe that donna hanlon and um, all of her people um, are committed the vast majority you know are committed in that way um, we are, are fortunate that way and if we all work together um, we can come up with creative solutions um, we are seeing not only in the school system but at PRMC, at our detention centers, our law enforcement officers suffer it every day on the street. There is a lack of respect um, for people, let alone authority. Um, our community should know that their words and their actions matter and that they'll be held accountable. Um, with all of us taking a little more responsibility that way, we'll be better off in the end. There was a big fight at uh, either Parkside or Bennett and um there were some charges actually filed against some of the kids. It was the first time mm -hmm. I'd seen that in forever, where, where kids were actually charged with what they did at school in terms of a crime. Do you want to talk about mm -hmm. that? So um, actually, children get charged um, for what happens at school, acts of violence committed um, against each other or uh, school employees or SROs. They, they get charged all the time, but most of that happens in the juvenile arena. So it's confidential, right. no one can talk about it. In that instance, um, two of, no, I'm sorry, three of those perpetrators were adults. So we were permitted to um, proceed in the district court um, with them as adults. And um, I hope that that sent a message um, that we're taking those things seriously. In juvenile cases, it's difficult to send a message because we can't talk about it. And there's a task force that you're on. And what is the task force trying to do right now? The Youth Safety Task Force is concerned with the safety of students and the safety of our schools. It is, it is that simple. Um, we all have different um, toolkits in our, um, our toolboxes. Uh, so we, um, the Department of Juvenile Services, 
Wicomico County Public Schools, the sheriff himself, and um, myself and two members of my office routinely meet um, to discuss those issues and to um, figure out the, kind of the best way that we can tackle um, on a system basis those issues. The other thing you've been in the news for lately, and you had a column in our paper about this, um, which was, it's fascinating to me, the idea that people can actually be, who have a medical marijuana card, uh, have been seen or known to smoke marijuana in public in their cars, and there's not the penalty that's on the same line as if you're drinking in your car. Mm -hmm. uh, so an officer can charge me differently than they can the marijuana user in the car. Um, and you all, you and the Sheriff Mike Lewis, mm -hmm. were looking to perhaps streamline this so that the, the offenses would be the same. So it, it's you cannot drive intoxicated. So it, it's just more, it, it is far more difficult for us to prove that. Um, with marijuana, there is no test, you know, to determine um, except field sobriety tests. So we are trying to keep society safe by saying you can't smoke in your vehicle um, because, and you can't smoke on the street because other people are affected by that. It it is that simple. And when it people get simple. the medical card, they sign a waiver that says, "I won't do this out in public. I won't do this in my car." Uh, I I believe so. I've not seen the card myself, but that's what I've been told. Yeah. So, but. But the perception of the public is they're coming after us for smoking marijuana, but that's not mm -hmm. really the case. No, 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 it's not. We understand that there are medical uses, that there are legitimate people get great benefit um, and relief from that. We are not looking to interfere with that. We just want to keep our roads safe. It is that simple. Now, where does that legislation or that idea sort of stand? So we, um, the... County Council um, requested that, or members of the County Council requested that we um, get an AG's opinion. So we have requested that we anticipate a, um, it's, not, it's not an official opinion from them, but an advice, I think is what they call it. Um, so we should expect that in another couple of weeks. I think in Fruitland they passed a measure, uh, yes. which is sort of uh, groundbreaking. It doesn't exist mm -hmm. anywhere else in the state, I'm told. But that was from you know people complaining about a public consumption of marijuana mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, or consumption in, in public areas. They would smell it while they were at the ballpark mm -hmm. or someplace like that. And that's certainly not the idea. I mean, it's not how people should be in society, I guess. No, it's it, it's a nuisance type problem. You know, if, if I'm there with my kids, you know, I, I don't want my kids intoxicated. I don't want to be intoxicated as a result. Uh, again, respect for others. Um, it's... It's, it really is not that complicated. Right. <laughs> we talk about opioids all the time when you're running mm -hmm. for election. We talked about that. That was the big problem. It's still a big problem. Maybe we just mm -hmm. don't talk about it as much. It is. Um, it, it remains a big problem. Overdoses remain um, a concern um, for uh, parents. You just see them suffer all the time. You know, um, it's a permanent so we are continuing. Um, we remain a member of the opioid intervention team. Um, I attend senior policy meetings at the county executive's office with the health officer uh, every month. Um, my in, two other members of my staff go to other regular meetings. It's interesting as a result of what's happening um, with opioids, um, Lori Brewster in December brought to our senior policy table um, a grant that we have received um, from the Governor's Office of Crime Control and Prevention um, for law, it lead, law enforcement assisted diversion. So when law enforcement officers have contact with someone on the street, and it is in the nature of a nuisance crime, certainly not a crime of violence, a drug issue, and, and that individual has mental health it concerns and substance abuse problems, um, then our hope, um, and we've had several meetings to develop this program, but we really are, are committed to developing a sustainable program that's gonna work, um, is that they would be, as opposed to being prosecuted, um, they would be um, hooked up with a case manager and be given an, um, and identifying resources that can resolve their issue so law enforcement has less contacts with them and our communities better, safer in the end. So that's exciting. And the opioids trigger so much crime in terms of shoplifting and other mm -hmm. crimes where people are trying to- Burglaries, yeah. robberies, you know, the bank robberies that we've had lately, they're, um, uh, at least one of them, I think, they're um, drug court participants. I mean, it, it, we just can't, 
accountability is key. Accountability is key and um, opioids do create quite an issue when people are, um, their need to use is so great that they're willing to victimize other people as a result. So you were only elected in 2018. I mean, you've only been in this job a short period of time. Is it anything like you thought it would be? I didn't think that the challenges would be so many, uh, but we're, I've got the right team to help tackle these issues. I mean, if our success in 2019 um, says anything, it says that we have the right people in the right places and that each of them are committed to the community. We couldn't do the work that we're doing on opioids or in the schools, in our juvenile court or with PRMC um, and with the detention center and law enforcement generally, if I didn't have the right people. Um, we have um, conducted regular uh, roll call trainings for all of law enforcement. Um, we regularly meet with PRMC to address um, their concerns about safety and nurses' safety and, of course, the schools with teacher safety and student safety. So um, we've, we've got a lot to be proud of in the short amount of time, despite the challenges that are ahead. What's your biggest uh concern in terms of what the public understands or their perceptions of how all this works. I mean, the, the, we make the point all the time that the, the, the only thing we know about law really is what we learned on, from watching Perry Mason and Law and Order. Mm -hmm. So um, we cannot speak about things that are in investigative stage. Yeah. Um, we can't speak about things most of the time until it, a defendant has been charged. And then we can only speak about things that are a matter of public record. Right. It is only upon conviction um, that we can talk about most everything. We can't even still talk about everything then. We have legal and ethical obligations that will trump every time, every time. And that is why we provided the disclosures um, in such a fashion on the SPD stuff. I mean, it is. Um, we live in an age where social media, everybody thinks that they're entitled to information right. yesterday. Right. Um, but the reality is that's not how our process works. So a little patience and a little faith will get us a long way. And I get that all the time. People say, why don't you report this? Because I'll be sued for libel. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say it online, you can stay to the grocery store, right. but you can't put it in a printed newspaper. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and people don't understand that the, just even the premise of innocent until proven guilty. Right. It is, you know, by the time we, we protect the innocent, that is what we do. And sometimes, let's take the SU, the graffiti thing, for example. SU came to yeah, us. You've gotten some heat for that. Yeah. SU came to us and said, what do you think about charging? So while law enforcement can any citizen in this county can go to the commissioner's office and swear out charges. And the standard is probable cause. That is so low, right? But if you come to me and you say, what do you think about charging? I'm not gonna base that on a probable cause determination. I'm gonna base that on a reasonable expectation of conviction standard. And I do that to protect because our duty is great. By the time we charge somebody with something, or in, especially my office, right? But by and large, any individual, you charge them, there is always, that is a matter of public record that will carry with them forever, regardless of whether it's expunged or not. Um, and our standards should be higher. So um, it's, you know, uh, I don't know. Well, you're not going to charge anyone unless you think you can convict them in court. Right, right. Well, I, to be to do anything else would lack integrity, and I wouldn't be following my obligations. You can't just charge someone to make a point. No, no, that is not no. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Well, and, and this, and I don't mean to oversimplify We're not this, this, but, but there was a <laughs> there was a situation a, a couple years ago, really early in your term, where some guys uh, took chalk and wrote things on the courthouse steps. Oh, right. Um, sheriff goes on TV, admire the sheriff a lot, and says, these men need to go to jail for what they did. You were like, well, we'll see what happens in a court situation. It rained the next day. It's all gone. <laughs> you know, so, you know, their, their vandalism did not, did not last, and the case just sort of disappeared because there was no way a jury was going to convict these guys. No, That's what I saw, yeah. at least. So it's... Um, 
So you could have charged them to make a point. You, but we don't do that, right? Right. right. So uh, you're you're throwing me a bone, and I'm not taking it. Sorry. <laughs> I, I just, I, um, <laughs> our duty is greater. You're exactly right, Greg. Our duty is greater, and we don't charge people to make points. Right. Um, we charge people who we believe committed crimes, and we believe we can prove it. It, it, it is that simple, um, and that is something I wish the public understood. Um, last year, I got called as a juror. Um, and uh, I missed you. <laughs> no, it was, in Worcester, it was in Worcester County. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but it just fascinates me being in court forever as a reporter and seeing it from that perspective, knowing the prosecutors, knowing the police, having a working rapport with them, and then being in the jury pool and seeing it from that point of view. Um, historically, I've always been dismissed right away because of the, my association with paper. This time, they made me actually go through the motions. I didn't sit for any jury thing, but I, I had to show up four or five days. And it was fascinating to see and interact with the people in the jury room and what their perceptions were of what goes on. Mm -hmm. um, it, it alarmed me because they don't understand the system mm -hmm. so much, but it also it encouraged me because they really care about the system and they mm -hmm. wanted to participate. So that's been my observations as well, um, or, and the whole office is, it is fascinating um, what, you know, sometimes what they can get stuck on, you know, that we none of us anticipated, um, and even defense counsel didn't anticipate, or the court. Um, so it is, at every turn that we can, um, we try to educate the public, you know, that is why I issue the number of press releases that we do um, so that the public has an awareness about what goes on and the process. But um, certainly we um, aren't successful. If our juries are any indication, we're, I'm not completely <laughs> successful right, right. Um, at that. But we, you know, we've reached out in so many different aspects. We're doing, you know, um, we're teaching at SU um, some classes, some teachers have asked us to come in, in Warwick. Um, so we're really trying to reach the public. I, I do, I am, we all know a little bit more about how the system works. I, I think we have a little more confidence in it and um, maybe that goes to the transparency. What can we in the community do to help you do your job? No, um, be patient and a little bit faithful. So um, you've elected, um, your leaders, um, who some of those leaderships have made appointments um, in law enforcement leadership. Um, be patient with us, um, have a little confidence that we're doing the right thing and a little faith that in the end, um, they will have the result. They will be able to know what happened um, and we can give them the transparency that they deserve. I know it's so uncomfortable for you to come on here today and talk about all these things. But Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. This is really important that people know what's going on so they get a sense when they see these stories, like who's behind it, who's helping make the decisions. Mm -hmm. So thanks for talking to yeah. us today. Thanks for having me, Greg. She's Jamie Dykes. She's our state's attorney, um, highest profile job in the community right now, and she's doing it. She's hanging in there, so we, we have to say thank you to that. <laughs> I'm Greg Bassett from the Salisbury Independent Newspaper, another edition of 101 right here on PAC-14. First Shore Federal is proud to support PAC-14 and one-on-one. -on -one. We'd encourage every business to support PAC-14 and, and pick a program and support it and let's make a difference.